Welcome to the Two Chumps Football Podcast. I'm Emil Calamino, and that guy over there with the Miami hat on it is the man who created this, Chad Wilson. Our show is sponsored by Bovada Sportsbook, as usual. And, uh, you know, as we've turned the show in, as if you're tuning in recently and you've missed the last few podcasts. We're Shame going, on you if you did. By shame the way. on you. Yes, we're Just handing out our division winners and some future bets for everybody before we get into the real game action. We've been going through it conference by conference, one uh, NFL conference each show, and usually only one college conference. But the last show, we aired a little bit and... Uh, I, I we fumbled. Up, yeah, we fumbled, so we're I clean. So, so today you're going to get two college football conferences. I'll be covering the SEC, and Chad will be doing the Big Ten. Or Can't the, wait. All 18 teams in the Big Ten. Golly. Golly. So we're going to be doing no, But that. hey, look, we're not covering the 18 teams because, like, no one here cares what Indiana is going to do unless it's going to put some money in someone's pocket. Correct. And, you know, to be fair to people, you know, who followed us over the years, we used to talk more on topics. If we see something that pops up that may be of interest for five or ten minutes, we'll talk about it. But we're purely now about giving you winners. That's what you want. That's what you come here for. Uh, In a couple weeks, we're going to give you winners on games. But right now, we're just handling the conferences. We'll review these after the season. We'll own whatever we tell you here. So uh, with Without further ado, because it's, again, the last two shows, we did the two NFL conferences that I keep giving the analogy, it's the pickle. When I get this big... We're just going to get that out of the way. Yeah, I eat the pickle, then I touch the fries and the burger. And look, before we dive into that, though, um, look, you've been uh, apparently under a rock um, and missed Deion Sanders cutting off a CBS reporter that was trying to ask him a question at a press conference. I want to say it was after the first uh, practice or something of that nature. And they, you know, really wanted some, some, you know, some answers from Dion, as you would, you know, as you start to launch into your fall practice and get geared up for your season. And Dion stopped the reporter and said, oh, CBS, I'm not doing anything with CBS. By the way, Dion used to work for CBS, if you remember, he used to do NFL Today show, but nevertheless, I think this stems from some um, articles or reports that were done that were really negative towards Dion, um, really himself as a as a as a coach. And I think um, one of them was calling in the second worst coach in the Big Twelve. I mean, hating on Colorado and Dion Sanders has become a business on itself, off to the side, and it just really has a lot to do with the cockiness and um you know the confidence that colorado shows despite not having a winning record but if anyone has competed in sports at any kind of a high level like a Deion sanders knows that you don't wait until you start winning to have that confidence but confidence comes first then so too comes a winning and there have been a lot of interpretations about what Deion sanders said and did there now the actual reporter was not the one that wrote or said any of those things but he's representing cbs so Dion sanders said i'm not doing anything with cbs i'm not taking a question from cbs he said i like you personally this is nothing on you personally it's just you represent cbs and so cbs is not good with me and he cut him off well i have i have a thought on why he's why he reacted that way but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, with, with just the context you gave me, in being fair here, uh, if there's 16 teams in the Big 12 and I'm going to rank the coaches, somebody has to be near the bottom. And I'm not saying he should be or shouldn't be. Mm. I never thought about – I don't really care much about ranking coaches. So yeah. it's not something I'm going to spend a lot of time on in my own head. But if you're going to do a list, somebody's going to be near the bottom. So based on the way Dion's reacting at least – He's saying that somebody shouldn't be talking to CBS because let's say he picked the coach from, I don't know, Kansas. So Kansas shouldn't talk to CBS. I mean, it's, you see what I'm trying to say? Like, it's a circular yeah. argument. Somebody's going to be near the bottom. Right. And I don't know who they call the worst. Um, I'm not privy to that particular report or, you know, article. 
But um, yeah, if we go off of exactly what you said there, the person who um, was going to be number two instead of Dion, you know, should have that problem. Whoever you call the worst, whoever they call the worst, should also have a problem. And people have definitely taken them to task. It doesn't take much now because there is you're either with Colorado or you're well, starkly well, against one it. One thing before you go, I think to be fair here, that seems to me just scrolling through the conference in my own head quick. That seems to be a little bit of clickbait if it was an internet article, like somebody at CBS figured I'll get a lot of attention and I'll put him near the bottom. Because Yeah, and it's the off season. So you know the kind of articles you right. get in the off season. And kudos to them. If they did that, you know, it would get uh, it would initially get a good amount, and then having Dion do what he did would have people going to look for it. So, so it gets revisited. It gets. It's like remember when movies would um, leave the big screen and then go to VHS. Yes. So you got the big screen money, and you may have even gone even better to in the aftermarket. So you know, CBS gets a win there. Falling short of that, many people have just said, "Oh, he's being um, he's being extra sensitive." about it and to a certain degree there may be some of that but something that i heard shannon sharp say in talking about the incident on his podcast with ocho cinco really brought something to mind in the for the first time in Deion sanders sports career he's being told that he's not good at something whenever has that happened to him he's been a phenom um at least since high school um and i read his book so the, his athletic prowess was goes back to youth sports and in two sports professionally. And I'm sure he was, he was, he, no, he was unbelievable in basketball in yeah. high school. Um, I don't know what he did in track in high school, but we know about what he did in track in college. Yeah. So when it has come to athletics, he has killed it and he's never really had to face any kind of criticism. So he's getting it now in, in the, in the sport that has made him famous. But I don't think it's really all about being sensitive. I think Deion Sanders has gotten to where he is due in large part to ignoring criticism, putting it off to the side, not really paying it any mind. And since he's facing it now and he's in such a public eye about it, like everything is coming his way, at least in the past, he's been on good football teams and it really wasn't all about Deion because he played with Jerry Rice and Steve Young and then he played with Troy Aitman and Michael Irvin and Emmitt Smith. So it wasn't really all about him. But in this particular case, it's all, you know, about him. He's facing it and he's just he's just chosen to do what he's probably always done in his life is if you're negative, you're over there. I don't want to deal with you. I want this positive kick, and that's how I operate. So I think it's more of that, but then there's probably some sensitivity well, in there as well, people would have. I mean, you know, we and we need a whole other podcast for this. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'll just say this. I think, and I don't think this is anything that anybody out there isn't thinking or at least doesn't realize when I say it. Dion is a lightning rod because he's a little bit of a culture war, right? Mm -hmm. Generally now. Yeah. Um, he played for the Cowboys, so I'm a big Dion fan. But if you really take a look, Dion, black people tend to like Dion. Right. Because culturally, culturally, he, he's fine. Sure. White people tend to not like him because they view him as a show off. Correct. And that's a little bit of a culture thing because when he came into the sport, remember, the NFL didn't have a lot of guys acting like Dion, he kind of changed it, right? I mean, the way- He did, especially at, at you know, yeah, at, at that time. I will say this about what you said about white folks. They love him if he's playing for their team. Correct. They hate him otherwise. Because that's sports fans in general, people root for the laundry. We know that from baseball, when guys get traded from the Red Sox to the Yankees and vice versa, all of a sudden, Wade Boggs, who was public enemy number one, Mm. Your was was well liked as a Yankee when he was hitting doubles for the Yankees. So, sure. but I'm saying generally, if you just poll people, and I have no, this is just my take. I could be completely wrong, but I don't think I am. If you poll most middle aged black guys, like Dion. Mm -hmm. Most middle aged white guys, real good player, too much of a show off. That's no, I, I would agree. Um, I think most. 
middle-aged white men are Carlton Fisk, who had a problem with Dion drawing the dollar sign in the batter's box when he was coming to bat. I think if you have, I mean, you can name a black catcher, maybe Charles Johnson, who I know personally, um, who's kind of a conservative black guy, at least outwardly so, uh, appearing that way, would have had, might have giggled at that. I'm from Florida. You're from Florida. We get it. It's a, you know, that's cool. Whatever. Now I'm gonna call this. Now I'm gonna call this slider down in a way to get you struck out. But it's the difference in just how people were raised. You know, I mean, again, we're a different show here. But yeah. black people are more expressive, t- typically. Yes. Uh, they, they like to dance. They like music. So the whole thing, you get white guys. Their father said, "You hit a home run. Put your head down and run." Right. Because because I'll because I'll slap you backside the head if you swipe. Right. <laughs> right. So, well, and just, if you're Ricky Henderson and you come from Oakland, everything is we're gonna let you know. Yes. And that's what that's anyway, what yeah. So I think I think people pick on Dion. A little bit of it is people who can't get attention pick on him because it gets them attention because you picked on Dion and you know. I'll tell you this: if he can get Colorado to where he wants them to be, this will have a really um big Miami of the 80s feel where everyone hated us for the kind of the same reasons. We're cocky, we're showboatish, um, and we've come from nothing, which is what Colorado would be doing at this point. And that was really us. You know, we were um, we were a college playing on Friday nights, giving away tickets at the local Burger Kings. If you bought a if you bought a Whopper to we're national champions and we're showboating and putting it in your face, I think. And there was I nothing, think that's going to be good and fun for college football. In the like, 80s, there was nothing that was more polarizing than either a Miami-Penn State game or a Miami-Notre Dame game. Sure. Those teams came. All the guys are going to come. They're going to have their suit and tie on. They're going to, yes, sir, no, sir, this. And, and then Miami shows up. And yeah. it's on. And we're the complete opposite. Complete opposite. So All right. Okay, so let's get to my pickles here. Let's do the the AFC South. I I don't have much on this, so I'm going to hit you quick with mine. This is a division that honestly I feel like you could put it in a hat. At least the top three teams that I have, shake it up, pick one out, and you might be right. I'm going to go only with. Are you, are you telling me, us, the audience, everyone viewing this, that this is not the division that's going to produce the Super Bowl champion or the conference winner? Well, if you listen to people at various outlets, they're really high on Houston. I think Houston might be maybe not as much of a disappointment as Atlanta, who's getting a lot of hype. But I think Houston's got a a big hype train that they're not going to be able to fulfill. I got them winning a division of 10 and 7 only because I truly believe top to bottom they have the best roster in this division. And I like Ryan's as a coach. But I think last year's is going to put a bullseye on their back Mm -hmm. and second year for cj stroud teams will study film a little bit he may throw a few more picks than he did last year so i think it's going to be harder for them to win this division than a lot of people think that said i still think they have a little bit of a gap talent wise so i'm going to go houston 10 and 7. i have the colts second on their heels at nine and eight um you know, I think the Colts quarterback play is what holds them back, and we'll see if that improves this year. Yeah. Generally, I like the Colts roster, but uh, until I see more from that quarterback position, I'm going to keep them at 9-8 second. The Jags, truthfully, they could win this division. I have them at 8-9, and nine, but until they do something, like it seems like the Jags just figure out ways – to like the, like what a couple of years ago, I think they had to beat Tennessee, was it, at the end of the year? Or the Colts, who were horrible. Yeah. And, and they got not just beaten, they got drilled to lose the division. So I got them at eight and nine third, and I don't know what to make of the Titans this year. I've got them at six and 11. I, I don't have a promising season for them. Um, I like nothing, nothing in terms of over-unders in this division because I did my records like I do. And then I looked at the over-unders. And sure. I was pretty That's much, the only way to do it. Yeah, I was pretty much like right on the number. So I'm like, I don't really see much here. I'm going to take Houston at plus 105 to win the division just because I want it. I, I I could actually see them if, if they don't do the things I said and they actually, you know, 
go the other direction. They could, I think they could win the division by two or three games. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think some, they'll get some injuries they're not expecting. C.J. Stroud will regress a little bit. And even then, I still think they managed to win 10 games. So I've got, you know, I'm going to take them to win the division at plus 105. That's my only bet. Gotcha. Uh, I see this uh, slightly different. I'm going to go with Jacksonville to win this thing. All right. First of all, you gave Trevor Lawrence all that money. You better perform. That's number one. But no, um, I think Jacksonville is steady here and no one's kite. They're not going to have the expectations that Houston do uh, has coming into this thing. I like a lot of what I saw from Jacks Jacksonville, and I do believe in Doug Peterson as a coach. And I think uh, what do you got the record at nine and eight. By so the way. wait, you got Jacksonville winning this division barely over five hundred. So you you really don't think Houston's going to have a winning season, huh? No, I, I've got Houston at eight and nine. I think they take a step back. I do think they're a good program. I do like D'Amico Ryan's as a coach. I like C.J. Stroud. But he came out of nowhere pretty much last year. Um, no one was expecting him to do what he did. And I know what it gets like in the offseason is people really start focusing on you, deconstructing you, finding ways to, to get in your way um, that you operate. And I think as a sophomore quarterback, um, and I've been watching C.J. Stroud go around, it's good to have confidence. But... I've seen what, to me, might err on the side of a little bit too much. There might be a balloon that needs to get popped, and it could indeed have that happen to them. He's throwing himself a little bit, huh? A little bit. You know, I've watched him out there a little, you know, just a little bit. And I'm a guy who loves confidence. I mean, hell, I, I like Deion Sanders coming up. You like Ricky Henderson. Ricky Henderson, Reggie Jackson, Muhammad Ali. I mean, it's uh, all about you, Let me ask you about this. What do you think about, I mean, they got digs, right? That's a guy there that you're going to have to share the football with Nico Collins and Tank Dell. And you're going to need to run the ball some. And I just worry about Stefan Diggs being a fly in the ointment if we get two, three games in a row where you target it two or three times. Because it's I CJ Stroud looked like he had a pretty good relationship with Tank Dell and Nico Collins. And I think when CJ Stroud gets in trouble, and that's going to be the way to attack the Houston Texans this year is attack the protection. Um, because there's, you know, there's so, yeah, there's mean, a really good relationship with quarterback and receiver. So when he's on the fire, I know quarterbacks look for that guy, and it won't be Stefan Diggs. And if they start facing problems up front and C.J. Stroud is trying to get the ball out quick or move around and throw the football, it's going to tank Dell. It's going to Nico Collins, then maybe Stefan Diggs. Let's not forget they got a pretty good tight end, too, who's always a good person. Uh, I think to people ball. forget that with, uh, you know, fans tend to forget that with football and basketball being different than baseball in the sense that in baseball, everybody gets the bat. Yeah. In football and basketball, you can have too much talent sometimes because sure. – there's only one ball, right? So uh, only so many shots. Talent who's going to demand the football. Yes. You know, in me. That's what I mean. Yeah. You can have too much talent because if I get two diva wide receivers on the same team, I can't throw them both the ball. That's obvious on the same play. Right. And there's only so many balls, that, you know, out there in a game. So there's going to be games where one of them only has two catches for 25 yards, and they have to be okay with that. Yeah, now mind you, I wouldn't classify Nico Collins or Tank Dell as divas. I'm but Stefan Diggs, Stephon Diggs, I would classify as that. And as a receiver, sometimes the only way to really get the football, if you're not painting your hair platinum, is to make noise, which we saw him do with Josh Allen. And they didn't have as much talent at wide receiver in Buffalo. So this could end up being a bit of a problem. We'll see how that develops. Hopefully I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But I, I see there being, with the attention being put on them and expectations, a slight fallback. Hopefully they they get things worked out. And then the third year is a really good year for the Houston Texans. So I have them at 8-9, which um, is the same record I have the Indianapolis Colts at. I happen to like Anthony Richardson. I, I, I think he could do some really great things there as a young quarterback. I don't know what his career is going to mature into, but at this point in time right now, if they can keep things vanilla for him, it could be like the early years with RG3, a guy who could run and throw. I don't know how much he's going to be willing to run after an injury last year, but it's a toss-up for me for number two, crazy as that sounds. Everyone's going to want to just 
grandfather Houston in because they did so well last year. But I think it's a battle for second between Houston and Indianapolis, right, division, according to my model. If this division plays out the way you have it, mm. nobody will be sitting on the edge of their seats except the fans in these four cities. Um, it's fun, but not fun. So, yeah. and and then finally, have, I said, obviously, you have them last. What do you got them at? Seven to ten. Uh, they wouldn't surprise me if they were six and eleven, like you said. I think we, we the consensus between the two of us is that they will be at the bottom, looking up at everyone else. So, given that, I I love plus odds in in uh, in these futures to win. So, I get a good I get a good bet here at two seventy with Jacksonville. I don't like the odds on Houston. Even if I liked Houston to win this division, I don't think it would be by much. So plus one twenty-five or plus one hundred five mm-hmm. doesn't do it for me. So I I feel good getting plus two seventy with Jacksonville. And I'm with you. I was kind of close in my own handicapping to the futures on the over under totals. The only one I would take a fly at is is Houston under nine and a half. I don't see them as a ten win team at plus one twenty five. Plus 125. So a couple of things in bookkeeping. Let me recap, and then I'll tell you guys. Uh, I have Houston winning the division. I'm going to begrudgingly say if you're going to make a futures bet, I'll take them at plus 105. Chad's going to go Jacksonville. He's got them at plus 270. I've got no over-unders on this division. Chad's going under, under on the Texans. They're under 9.5 at plus 125 money. We will recap at the end of this whole exercise before the season starts our best plays for any futures or over-under. So, you know, we're giving a lot out in case any of you want to be degenerates. But, I mean, at the end, if you want to hone it down, we'll kind of give you a Yeah, it's the average Joe that's just going to throw a couple of these or maybe yeah. you're maybe you're taking a trip through Vegas before the season starts. Yeah. We'll get you squared away. We'll get you squared away. So, you know, go to Bavada, use them, put everything in. But wait, wait, we'll, 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 we'll pare this down for you. Now, we've got to do our college – and I'm going to let you go first today. You're going to handle the Big Ten here. Yes, I am going to handle the Big Ten. Um, Amol did the Big Ten last week, and he did have Ohio State as as standing atop this um, conference. The Big Ten of the Big Ten of eighteen. I think that's what yes, I'm going to start calling. Big Ten of eighteen. You know, Amol, Ohio State better do that because they've recruited their rare end off. They've done well in the transfer portal. They've done everything right going into the season. And with Jim Harbaugh and his violations and everything else leading for Los Angeles, there's the biggest problem out of the way. Now, mind you, um, the conference did Ohio State a favor and brought in the biggest names from the Pac-12 to fill in for whatever Michigan um, kind of did to them. But I, I think Ohio State still stands above talent-wise. Yeah. Um, this is Amal, a big year for Ryan Day because with what you've been able to do recruiting wise, the acquisition of talent, if you falter now, the seat gets really, really hot for Ryan Day and whether or not it should is um, neither. It's not really the question for us to answer. We just know that that's how things are because expectations are high, which they always are for any school after Urban Meyer leaves. The man comes in, he wins, he leaves in a storm, and afterwards the fans expect a certain thing, and it's tough on the next Let's guy. Let's be game. honest. If Oregon walks into the Big Ten and wins it, Day, Day's going to have a problem. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and they didn't fare that well against Oregon the last time they faced him. But I have uh, Ohio State at 11-1 and one, number one. Here's the thing. I've got Oregon also at 11-1. and one. As number two in this, they you like you, I have them meeting in the championship game in Ohio State, prevailing. But you know anything can happen when you get to that game. And this not like in years past where your winner on that one side is going to face Iowa, no. who has no chance. No, no, no. We've got a different situation. And they play each other in the regular season, so which makes things tough. Makes the winner of that first has a yeah. problem in the second game. As I've always preached on this show, it's hard to beat a good team twice. So that's going to be fun to watch. We'll maintain, and I know you will echo this, we've made all, we've, we've had problems with all kind of logistical and legislative things that have been done in college football um, over the last few years and even this offseason. 
but we're both excited about what's going to actually happen on the field throughout the fall in college football. Yeah, because teams are going to take losses, and I'm sick of watching teams go 12-0 and playing five cupcake games that, you know, I call them tunnel games. You ran through the tunnel and you won, okay? Yeah, uh, this was this was one when it was put on the schedule. Yeah. So we're not going to have too many of those. There's still some, but we're not going to have too many of those. So Oregon number two, I got Penn State at number three, which I think you also had. I think yep. you had them at nine and three. I've got them at ten and two. Okay, could be hard to do, but it's somehow. Fair then, I could Jimmy see. Franklin better stand up here. Yeah, he better. Ten and two. Now here, I'm going to have let me pull some shoppers here for you, Emil. All right. I've got number four as Nebraska. Okay. All right, Paul Feinbaum will not like me for saying this, but you made all that noise, and you took it to their head coach, and he may be able to be on one of those studio shows at the end of the year and shove it right back at Paul Feinbaum, which doesn't he doesn't seem to care about that. He'll throw stuff out early in the year and then eat his crow later I on. Think, I think he's he's another guy. He's a bomb thrower. Yeah, and I think the I think the brass. And uh, ESPN came to him and said, hey, listen, you're not on air because you're handsome, okay? So you better start ratcheting up because that's what we do here on ESPN. We cause controversy and we yell at each other on our talking head shows. So I need you to throw some bombs around here if you want to continue to be um, on and air. He, and he does. What and he brought him around. I've got Nebraska at nine and three. Nice. Finishing fourth. And, Amo, I'm going to do something wild here. Though I have Michigan with the same record as Iowa, I'm going to go Iowa as the fifth-place team in this division at 8-4. and four. Fair Love the way Iowa plays. I think they're going to do something a little bit more on offense, a little bit more on offense, and that's going to get them at 8-4. and four. Hey, this is the team that's been in the championship game the last few years. Anyone thinking we're just going to cast them off to the side because these West Coast guys have showed up, might want to think again because Iowa can grab one of those West Coast boys that are used to a fast-paced game and lull them completely to sleep oh, yeah. with really good defense and a boring offense that ball controls them and puts pressure on these, you know, West Coast, the West Coast homies. So uh, is it safe to say you will take Ohio State then to win the conference? No, because I, I'm not overwhelmed by the odds. So if I'm just looking at it from a betting standpoint – Oregon's close enough for me to go with them at plus 200. Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm playing it like that here. Um, and then, you know, for over-unders, Michigan State, I think, is going to be a disaster. All right? Um, the, what they had going on there last year um, doesn't leave you feeling all too great about their, their chances of doing anything this year, especially with the new arrivals. I see a three and nine season for them. And so the total there is four and a half and I can get plus plus one thirty five going wow, under that. Under four and a half for Michigan state. Who thought Sparty would fall that far? Hey, you know, you got to bottom out before you, before yeah. you attend. Nebraska is over seven and a half. If I've got them at night, I've got to love them uh, going over here. The only thing is I've got to go, I believe minus 20, minus one twenty two to do it. Just feel pretty solid about them getting over that. Yeah, that's all right. That's not huge money. And then Washington, everyone has them like they're going to stink. I get it. Coach left, you know, quarterback left, your big-time wide receivers left. Still think they're a solid program. So if I think they're 8-4 and and the number is over 6.5, I'll go go there at plus 104, I think is what I'm getting. Uh, let's let's be consistent because I had that one last show and it was minus 105 at the time. So let's score. All right, so we'll do a 105 there for I you. I like the same one on that. Well, you'll be generous now because I don't think that's going to make the cut in my best up. Well, maybe not. Um, we'll see when we get to it. But so you got you. Let's see. You got Oregon. Even though you think Ohio State would probably be your favorite to win the conference, you're going to take the money because you have them very even, and you're going to take Oregon plus 200 on a future to win the, the Big Ten, okay? Uh, and Chad's got his three over-unders in this conference. He's got three of them. He's got under four and a half on Michigan State. They're plus 135. He's going over seven and a half wins for Nebraska. Makes sense. You have them at nine and three. Uh, they're minus 122. 
And like me, he likes over six and a half for the Huskies. Washington, uh, and we're going to score that at minus 105 since I gave that out last show. There you go. It's wrapped. It's not wrapped because I'm going to do the SEC. Well, the Big Ten is wrapped. Yeah, the Big Ten is wrapped. So last uh, last show, Chad had the SEC. He had uh, Texas close enough. He thinks Georgia will win it, but Georgia was really chalky. And uh, so he's giving Texas at plus 300. And you know what? Which, by the way, since we did that, I think Texas lost their top two running backs. Yeah, I don't think that's – Texas probably has 17 running backs the way they (laughs) recruited there. Um, This kind of reminds me when Daryl Royal was there in the 70s, the way they've been recruiting. So Maybe there's a Ricky Williams tucked away there that we don't know. know, And with the quarterback play, I'm not sure that – you know. I think think running will be like dessert. (laughs) There you go. So, anyway, I'm going to – I have Georgia and Texas here – both finishing 11 and one. Um, and I like Texas to actually win this conference. I'm going to take them plus 300, not just because of the money. I really think they're just going to win the conference. I, I, I think this is the year they put it all together. This kid's leaving for the NFL after this season. He's got experience. They've got a good roster. Sark seems, seems to have found himself as a coach. So I, I got Texas beating Georgia and winning the conference. I think Georgia has a great I'm, team. I'm running through Texas's schedule here. You know what else I found to be interesting? Um, both with the Big Ten and the SEC who have these new imports, and so the in-conference schedules get even more challenging. The, the kickoff games, um, they have not shied away. Like Texas and Michigan are playing September 7th. So they got a game there with Michigan, which we both agree are going to fall back. They do have Oklahoma. They do play Georgia in the regular season. Well, um, you know, that's the funny thing. They, you know, they online, as you know, people have a lot of fun online because they apparently, you know, during the offseason, USC was trying to get out of the LSU game. Not because they're scared of LSU. What people forget is they're going to the Big Ten. Right. And they have Notre Dame on their schedule. Sure. So Absolutely. Yeah, it's a little. It gets a little bit daunting. So what people forget is Texas already had Michigan on the schedule, and it is what it is. But I don't think that's going to be. A I can see him eleven and one here. It's not out of the no, question. I, I, I had him. I had him at ten and two for Texas. I mean, I know it's early, and maybe I'll change my mind by the time they play. But sitting here today, mid-August. I think Texas will handle Michigan. So I yeah, early in the year with a. I mean, though Shamar Moore has been there. It's a brand new head coach. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got Texas 11 and 1, Georgia 11 and 1. Texas wins the, the championship game. Georgia has a good year. I kind of see Oklahoma like you do. I think they're a lot better than people think they are. Um, what do you got for a record? 10 and 2. I've got Oklahoma 10 and 2. One thing we. So you also like the new arrivals coming in here and dominating in the SEC? Well, I just think people are being silly when they say like a like Oklahoma or Texas traditionally really good programs are just going to come here and be dogs. I just think that's like people in the SEC country wishing. I, yeah. I, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I see Ole Miss better than you did. I think they're going to be nine and three. I know they're not big on defense, but Kiffin's really got that offense humming. And I looked it through their schedule and I like kind of the way it lays out. I mean, there's obviously losses in there for everybody. But I think, you know, I think they played six games when I looked at it, where the first six, they should be 6-0. and oh. You know, I mean, unless they get upset. You know, I looked at the schedule and said, um, you know, eh, I'm, I might have I sold them a little short there. But again, you never know. It's a you special thing. Like, unless they find a way to lose to a Kentucky or South Carolina, they should finish the first half of their season 6-0. and oh. Then there's some tough games. But again... If you do what you're supposed to do, you split the tough games and you're nine and three. So I've got them there. I think AM surprises people this year. I've, I've got them also at uh, nine and three. Uh, and I, I again, I think it's a brand new coaching town there. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know, but I like, I, and I like Missouri to be in that nine and three range. So I've got a whole pile of teams beating the hell out of one another. What I don't have, and that's because. Like you, I have Alabama eight and four or worse. Um, 
Yeah, that's going to be, I'm telling you, Emil, that's going to be such a tough pill to swallow. If we're right, if we're wrong, then we'll be laughing. Yeah, if that card plays out, that's going to be a tough pill to swallow in Tuscaloosa. And I don't, I, I don't wish that on anyone in that building if that's how that goes down. Uh, Let me ask you this for our fan base who's going to be, we're going to have a good contingent of Florida folks in here. What do you, what do you have Florida at this year? I have to be honest with you. I didn't go through their schedule in detail because we didn't. But I mean, I don't know that I mentioned it last week, but I have them at five and seven, which would be above what a good amount of folks are saying. Well, I looked through everybody's schedule and just kind of running it in my head. I had them in that 500 range. Mm. You know, I think, Emil, they go 600. Six and six. They go. Oh, I'm sorry. 600. If they go 500, if they go six and six. You give Billy Napier a raise because they've got one hell of a schedule. Oh, the schedule's and they've not yet had a winning season under him. But I think the last season, or the, maybe the last two seasons under Mullen, were losing seasons. Napier's not had a winning season, and now this is this is, conference has become more challenging than ever. If he can pull out a 500 season with what they have in front of them. I think that's a hell of a job. I think the first game against Miami is 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 going pivotal. To, well, it's pivotal because I think if they could somehow get an upset win, it could give them some confidence to maybe win a few ball games that we don't expect. Conversely, if Miami goes and lays one on them early, it could be a really long or game. a long year. I, we probably won't. I probably won't hit that five and seven. You for sure won't get that six and six. No, so. no. so so you know. Also known as going six hundred. <laughs> you go six. You're thinking baseball right now, playing six hundred ball. Um, I've only got two over under plays in this in this conference. Um, so wait, you like Texas to win it, and I that's plus three hundred. Plus three hundred. Okay, gotcha. Only two over unders. I'm going hard, Bama under nine and a half. I'm laying one thirty-five. I, I think you have to. I think I have to. I mean, if 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 this coach comes in there, I know he's a good coach, and you win ten ball games in this conference as a first-year coach, they should start start erecting a statue for him next to Bear Bryant and Nick right. Saban because oh, I think gee. that's a very tall order. W- looking at their schedule, j- just everything that's transpired there, I think sure. it would be hard. So I got them under nine and a half. And I, I'm real hard over seven and a half on Oklahoma, and they're only minus one ten. Wow. I mean, what's what the what's the over in the number? Seven and a half. That's crazy. That's crazy. You're telling me Oklahoma's got to be an eight and fourteen for me to win. And what do you got to lay for that? Even money minus one ten. I think I missed that one. I would, I would for sure take that because I've got, I've got Oklahoma at ten and two. So you might want to, you might want to log me down for that. Uh, one. Listen, I, I, I am the scorekeeper. Yes, you put me down. down for over seven and a half. I feel like Sebastian in that show, The Bookie, and you. <laughs> <laughs> and though I lay, um, though I love plus um, action for those over unders, this might be so solid. A pick that minus one ten doesn't bother me at all. So. No, I mean I saw that and I, and I was looking like on my screen going, "Am I sure?" Yeah, but no, I mean I, I have a hard time believing Oklahoma just comes in here and lays an egg. Okay, so that how it shakes out for you. So you know we, we recapping, recapping. We gave we you got, yeah, go ahead. Amos got Amos got Texas winning this division, though he believes Texas and Georgia will both be eleven and one teams. He just thinks Texas. Um, gets it done this time coming over as the newbie. That's going to piss off the true Southerners. The, the OG Southeastern Conference folks are not going to like that at all. Um, but yes, you like them also at plus 300, which makes sense if you like them to win the division. He thinks Oklahoma is the third place team in this division at 10 and 2. Also, if you like them at 10 and 2, then you got to love the over 7.5 at minus 110, which I also picked up today thanks to Emil uncovering that uh, doozy there for us. The fourth place team he believes is going to be Ole Miss. He likes them a little more than me. I crazily said there'll be a seven and five team last year. He thinks they're a nine and three team, which the, he doesn't take any futures action on that because that's pretty close to the number. And then finally, he thinks Texas A&M is going to be a bit of a surprise at nine and three. I don't totally disagree. I have them at eight and four, though, 
there wasn't any action that the I love. The problem loved. with AM is, and they've been doing this for 30 or 40 years, I mean, maybe longer. They recruit very well, so the roster is always. Oh, that old lane is long in, uh, yeah. in College Station. So um, he does have Alabama at eight and four, like me. So he also, like me, likes under nine and a half and minus 135. Bama fans, don't go crazy on us. Let's see how this season unfolds. Don't write any checks. <laughs> These Alabama fans that you guys won't be able to cash this year. Let's see how it goes. conferences that we did today, the SEC and the Big Ten, are absolute meat grinders. Yes, they, they absolutely are. I mean, they and are. Which may end up being the two conferences that are the top um, the top league, let's say. Well, in I know the NFL will never lose its place in American history because of Fantasy football and gambling, it's the easiest to gamble on. You only got to follow 32 teams, not 100. Yes. But, but I'm telling you, between these two conferences, if you're if, if you're going to find yourself, if you only have one day on the weekend that the, the wife's letting you or the girlfriend's letting you watch football, you might be picking Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't see down the road, Emil, um, in the not-too-distant future, these two conferences being the only of the uh, – what we previously know as the Power of Five, all per, you know, containing 24 teams, uh, maybe 12 on one side, 12 on the other um, as divisions. And they do some type of a 16-team playoff that comprises, you know, I'm, 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 I can see that happening. It's probably headed, you know, we, we can talk about that during the season. When we have. You know who's going to control that. That's going to be television. If television decides... Yeah. If they want that, that's what will end up happening because the power has been duly ripped out of the hands of the NCAA and put into the hands of ESPN and CBS and and, and all of these media outlets that televise the games. They now hold the power. So if that's what they want, if they think that's going to drive viewership, and I think this year is going to be a very good barometer for that. They're going to watch the the types of excitement that the Big Ten and the SEC generate because they have now brought these new teams in here and been bigger. They're gonna. They're certainly going to read all the data on the 12 team playoff. And if it reads well, we're gonna we're we gonna be. Basically said we don't care about rules for by and large. I mean, I know Jim Harbaugh just got slammed, but I mean, he, he got slammed because Michigan is now slammable because he left. Because he left. Um, end of the day. Let's be honest, and we've talked about this for a decade now. On Sundays, it's hard to get jazzed about the entire NFL slate. You can pick a game, a mm -hmm. Sunday night game or a 430 game that you're like, hey, I'm not a fan of either team, but I've got to see that game. But generally, most Sundays are – you can go out and do some yard work or go, go to the mall or whatever you're doing because there's a lot of games on those schedules that are like, oh. <laughs> Sure. Sure. Um, expanding a little bit on that before we wrap this show up, I think if you're one of these other marquee teams and the other conferences, Big 12, ACC, you better be hard at work in trying to position yourself in either the SEC or the Big 10 in the really near future because that's where it's going to be. You're going to find yourself on the outside looking in. So if you're Florida State, if you're Clemson, if you're Miami. I think Notre Dame's foolish. For, for not getting their sports into the Big Ten period and making a play in football because... I'm sure it's a solid discussion that they debate about each and every year. I think it's on the docket in their off-season meetings, and I think they might have been far right on this thing, and they might be coming a little more well, to... Jerry really Jones of, the, of, of college football. What I mean by that is I sent you an article the other day where somebody was just castigating Jerry Jones, basically saying, look, you have the most valuable sports franchise in the world. You spent the least amount of money over mm -hmm. a three-year period on free agents. You're a carnival barker. And I think Notre Dame's kind of living off that NBC contract in a different way. Right. And, you know, they, they're happy. Just they get in the playoff and get drilled. They don't care. Really? But that's You got our money. You got our money. And that schedule is not preparing them. I know they have games in the schedule – Oh, they play USC or they'll play Florida State or Clemson. But generally, there's Army and Navies on there. I mean, it's not going to prepare them properly for what So correct doing. me if I'm wrong. We have 17 teams in the Big 12 now? We've got 16 in the Big 12, 18 
in the Big Ten in the SEC? So they're according to what I think might happen here. We've got 14 teams out there that will eventually end up in one of these two conferences. I think I'm going to sit here and play around with who could make up those 14 teams and who really should be positioning themselves to get into one of these two conferences and not be on the outside of it. Well, right. And you're going to, and I think, I think to get the, the high seeds in these playoffs, however they arrange of 12, 14 teams, you're going to need to be winning the SEC or the Big Ten. So I think if you're sitting there and you're not in that conference or you're Notre Dame, you're always going to be playing that extra game to try to win a championship. Yeah. Yeah, and crying about it or crying whatever. It, but you just can't – Notre Dame's getting to the point where you can't play 12 games and avoid what these other teams are going through, avoid a championship game, and then make an argument that you should be a top seed. won't happen. Right, right. All right, I think that's going to do it for us here. On your way out, make sure you visit our sponsor, Bovada Sportsbook. They've got all of your lines for your future needs, conference championship winners, um, your playoff, you know, odds to make the playoffs for every one of these teams we've talked about, as well as your over-unders, um, both, the, you know, along the ones we've discussed, some that you may think you have an insight on. Um, they've got it all over there at Bovada Sportsbook. Hit the link in the description whether you're listening to the show or watching us on YouTube. So definitely do that. If you're brand new here or you haven't had a chance to do it yet, go ahead and subscribe to the show. And um, if you're on YouTube, you want to hit that bell so that you're notified the next time that we have a show like this. Outside of that, though, we're up next week, Amol, and we're going to put all this together and form a college football playoff. And then we're going to move into some we're of the more. We're getting very close to being giving out games. We are. College football is getting ready to kick off here in two weeks. It's on. It's well, they have those games like the 24th, but I'm not sure we're going to be picking. The only game that first weekend I looked at that might be mildly entertaining is like Minnesota, North Carolina. There's some real dogs in that first. Yeah, game. I mean, and that's what they've been doing. It's yeah. the, it's just the what comes after that that's going to yes. um, really get us going here. So, hey, don't you don't want to miss it. We've got more coming you guys' way next week. So we hope you guys enjoyed this. Go ahead and give the show a like and a share, and you can argue about this. If you guys have some comments on any of the picks that we've made or you have any questions or whatever it is you feel you need to say, we love the feedback. Go ahead and hit us in the comments section, and we would gladly appreciate it. All right, that's going to do it for us. We'll be back next week. For Amal Calamina, I'm Chad Wilson. Thanks for watching the Two Chumps Football Podcast. See you guys next week.